Welcome to worship on this Sunday from your homes and wherever you're gathering together today. We are glad that you could join and celebrate Christ's love for you. I'm Pastor Liz from our Savior's Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Jeff from Concordia Lutheran Church. Let us worship. As church, we confess the sin of racism and condemn racist rhetoric and the ideology of white supremacy. God have mercy. God, God have, have mercy. mercy. As church, we confess, repent, and repudiate the times when this church has been silent in the face of racial injustice. God have mercy. God, God have, have mercy. mercy. Racism is deeply ingrained within the ELCA, a predominantly white church. It is deeply embedded within the individual congregations whose members continue to foster stereotypes and support policies that actively hurt people of color. God have mercy. God, God have, have mercy. mercy. As church, we declare that the enslavement of black bodies and the removal of indigenous peoples establish racism in the United States, a truth this nation and this church have yet to fully embrace. God have mercy. God, God have, have mercy. mercy. Rooted in slavery, racism has manifested through the history of Jim Crow policies, racial segregation, the terror of lynching, extrajudicial killings by law enforcement, and the disproportionate incarceration of people of color. God have mercy. God, God have mercy. mercy. As church, we lament the institutional racism of discriminatory treatment within the call process, inequitable compensation of clergy of color, racial segregation, divestment from black communities and congregations, systemic policies and organizational practices, and a failure to fully include the gifts of leadership and worship styles of black people, indigenous people, and people of color. God have mercy. God, God have, have mercy. mercy. Confessions are empty promises without meaningful actions. Actions that are grounded in prayer, education, and soul-searching repentance. The sin of racism separates us from one another. But we trust that we are reconciled to God through Christ's death and resurrection. We seek such life-giving reconciliation with one another. As we repent, let us not turn back to ideologies that promote white supremacy. We trust that God can make all things new. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God, God of compassion, compassion you, you have, have opened, opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts, that overflowing with joy, 
we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Exodus. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
reading from Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves God's love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Word of God word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus set, sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy, and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be rise as serpents as innocent as doves. Beware of them. For they will hand you over to the councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, 
for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. So Pastor Jeff, what are you thinking as we hear these lessons this week? I've been thinking about Bacon's Rebellion. What's that? Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, in the 1670s, uh, in the in Virginia, um, there was uh, some kind of incident involving uh, some of the planters and landowners uh, who had been employing their European and African indentured servants, um, who for some reason uh, used an opportunity to come together, uh, these indentured servants, these slaves. Uh, against their uh, planter overlords, um, re rebelled against them. Um, and the uh, planters responded in, a, in kind of a crafty way. Um, they um, decided to prevent any future rebellions by uh, creating what we know today as the concept of race. They told the white uh, European uh, slaves that they were better than the um, than the black African slaves um, allowed um, it had been allowed for both uh, indentured servants to uh, secure their own freedom um, uh, but now it was uh, decided that the European slaves would be able to earn their own freedom and the African slaves would not. Um, and so thus began, in some of the language after this time, is where we see the first inklings of language about white people and black people, and a beginning of something that has spiraled out of control to our day, this portrayal, mm -hmm. this stereotype creation of, well, we are smarter than those people, those people are criminals, and we're, we're good, and all this kind of uh, language. And so I've been thinking about that, not just because of the, the events of recent weeks, um, but also because I'm spending this summer um, reflecting on the readings from Romans that we had today, the beginning of those series of readings, beginning with chapter 5. Um, and in Paul's world, um, he, he's not, of course, running up against this, uh, this program of uh, Tidewater Virginia aristocrats trying to uh, put down rebellions and, and, and uh, prevent future ones. Um, instead, he's dealing with an all-encompassing, powerful Roman Empire that is doing the same sort of thing. Hmm. The Romans are employing a program called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, um, that uses force and violence to, to you know, put off rebellions and to stay in power. But also, they are teaching that there are some nations and ethnicities that are superior to others. And that setting all of these different peoples across their empire against each other in competition for Rome's favor. And so when Paul goes about this Roman Empire creating communities of Jesus followers among the Gentile people, that's the call he's received from God, um, he's coming into contact with the, these Gentile people who have been taught and formed that they are inferior than some others, that they are superior to some others, and that they can be in competition with one another to, to get in Rome's good graces. And so, not unlike a time like ours, um, Paul is proclaiming that, well, the community of Jesus' followers needs to be different. It can't play this, this kind of a, a game where there's male and female against each other, and slave and free against each other, and... Jew and Gentile against each other. And so what we what we also see in Romans is Paul is uh, Paul is addressing some claims of this counter-missionary, another Jewish Jesus follower, who is saying, oh, these Gentiles need to become a certain way. They need to um, become law-abiding, uh, faithful in the Jewish way type people uh, in order to be part of the Jesus movement. And Paul says, no, that that is plain into a program just like the, the Romans program, where it's uh, if you do good or be good or become a certain way, then you will be favorable. In one case to, to Rome, and in one case to God. And, and 
the way I'm reading this is when um, in Romans 5, Paul talks about faith. And faith um, for Paul is not just like the faith we have, it's the faith that, that God shows in Jesus. And it's totally unlike the faith that the empire, the Caesar demands. Who um, There was a coin I read about that uh, it had that word faith on it, faithfulness. And it was the Caesar with a spear in one hand and a hand in welcome, an uh, open hand of welcome in the other. So it kind of communicates like, yeah, our hand is open to you if you obey and you mm -hmm. comply because then the threat of for force will make you do so. Instead, Paul talks about no, we see God's faithfulness to us in Jesus Christ who dies for sinners, who dies for the ungodly. That's a term that the Romans used for, um, for both Jews and Gentiles who, weren't, um, who were members of these nations that they had conquered, um, ungodly, un impious people because they didn't uh, worship the economic system and the Caesar and and uh, things like that. And so Paul in Romans is really concerned with, oh, come on, our religious ideas can't be feeding into the imperial program that's trying to set people against each other and, and forming people to think they're better than those other people. The way of Jesus for, for our life together is way different than that. Now, as you're talking about a, kind of a different formation to society, really, when, when Paul's saying we're not going to be um, mimicking the Roman Empire's need for for them to be stratified, really, to have... <laughs> you're reading Harry Potter with our daughter. You're not there yet, but you get to this scene um, eventually when it's kind of Voldemort's more in control, and they, they take out the old um, fountain in the middle of the Ministry mm. of Magic, and they put in a new fountain, and in the new fountain, you get the sense of the vision for community that people following Voldemort, the evil wizard, um, have. And it's um, the pureblood wizards crouch, er, standing on these crouching figures of mm. all the, the regular humans and kind of saying, we are, we are the ascended ones. We're the ones that are higher than everybody else, and we're going to um, stand over you and, and be your overlords. Mm. And that's the vision driving that society, you know, the kind of twisted, warped, evil society that, of course, spoiler alert, Harry Potter and his friends take down. But <laughs> uh, I think it also reminds me of um, when the first MBA class I was taking at Scholastica. Hmm. Uh, one of the exercises we had towards the very end um, was about negotiation, but it was a different kind of setup where at the beginning we were told we'd not be negotiating face to face. So we were negotiating by our actions. So we um, divided into two and each of us represented a company um, and we had a, a territory that we were both in and we had a little grid of, okay, you can charge this much for your services, um, but that means you'll get fewer clients. So it was kind mm. of a grid of Okay, if you raise your prices, people aren't going to hire you as much, but you'll maybe be making more because you're asking more per hour. And the other team had the same grid. And so every time we played, we had to pick um, what price we were going to set. And that would determine, it was kind of a, you know, okay, this is our price, this is their price, and how much um, we would each be getting at the end of the quarter or whatever you want to say. And, and the idea was that by our actions, we would be um, setting the price in reaction to each other. You know, if that, if those people on the other team had, had really raised their price or lowered the price, that would change how we would mm. react. And at the outset, of course, I'm trying to like win this game and, and think of a total different model for how we play this. So I'm like, we need to, um, find a higher wage or a um, price that we're going to pay our employees and, and ourselves uh, and and hope that the other team catches on because we could both be earning more money if we both had the same higher wage versus trying to under, mm -hmm. undercut the other person. Um, and that 
didn't work all the time because they sent me out to negotiate and I got the other team to agree with this. But then I come back to my group and my group decides, no, we're going to undercut so we get all the business and we're going to destroy it. And I'm like, you do that once and then you've lost the fit. You've lost the community. You've lost the trust as, hmm. as this new way of being together. And so, um, I maintain that my group's greed, uh, killed us, but everybody on the other team therefore hated me who, you know, said, oh, the pastor screwed us all over. But that was not my intention. The intention was mm. to say, how can we build a new society where we all win and we all have what we need? Um, and that takes stripping away the desire to to kill the competition. You know, it's how do we come together? And when you think about um, Paul's trying to get away from the, the necessity of a society, we built people on the bottom mm-hmm. that we, you know... Um, we have to have a stratified society in order for, like, that's what everybody needs. And it's, how, how does that, how does that match Christ and Jesus uh, or God's intention to create a planet where all have what they need and all are reflective of God's, God's image and God's worthy saying yeah. of this is my good creation. So both Jews and Gentiles in, in, in Paul's world are well trained in, in the game kind of like the game you were playing. Yeah. And they know how to play. Um, they know what they have to do to, to make Rome happy, or at least to not uh, come under their ire. Um, and Paul's, throughout Romans, Paul's presenting that what Rome's calling peace, what they even call faithfulness, that's not peace. That's not faithfulness. That's not grace. All these were that's not gospel. This is another word that the Romans would use too. Um, here we see in Jesus a totally different way of being together, of being human beings. It doesn't depend on people dying or people competing. That God is not involved in any way in this sort of the faith, the kind of faithfulness that that uh, relies on if you are good, then I'll be good to you. For Paul, what we see in Jesus is that God is good just because God is good to you. God. God's grace and love and care is in no way curried like a, a Caesar that needs your, uh, you know, needs you to be on your best behavior and acting uh, accordingly. And in our world today, just thinking about with we're commemorating the, the Emmanuel Nine, um, we are remembering the events of the last few weeks with George Floyd um, and many of the protests going on around the country. We too have been schooled in a certain way of playing a game. Um, tradition for um, 400 years to think that some people are superior to others um, and that there's different rules by which that we all have to play and some are privileged and some aren't. Um, and I'm hearing Paul's words as inviting us to, in the words you said, to strip it all down, to get rid of the stratification that everything depends on, um, to seek out God's dream of how we can be together. Uh, a dream that we see in Jesus who shows us God's goodness and love. Yeah, I think Romans is so fascinating. Um, when we get to the kind of rhetorical question that, that Paul poses in Romans, you know, um, maybe someone would die for a good person or, you know, and yet Jesus dies for the sinners. That sense that that there's no... There's no ladder for us to climb to get to the threshold. Okay, well, now we're good enough for God. Yeah. It's this sense that Jesus has come right into where we are and said, you might be told you're the worst of the worst, but I choose you, mm. and I choose you to love you, and I choose you to be the one I show my faithfulness to. And in doing that, I think Jesus um, breaks open this game that we're taught to live into. It breaks open all the rules to say... Um, Everything that you've thought was the way it had to be, where there would be good people and bad people, there would be the right people and the wrong people, and there would be the people who don't have a lot, and and their work uh, is what's going to help the people at the top be profitable and and successful, blessed, or whatever. And when Jesus comes and names the most lowly as the first and the most blessed, then Jesus helps us to see that that whole system can be turned around and can be, it doesn't have to be the way it is today. Hmm. 
Um, and, and when I'm thinking about these scripture, um, knowing that you were studying Romans, I was looking a little bit more at the Matthew gospel. And in Matthew, Jesus is looking at the needs of the world. And he says, these people need help, <laughs> you know, and, and he's out there and he's doing the, the one-on-one in the, the groups, you know, up to five thousands and whatever, um, feeding and healing and casting out demons and, and making a difference. Um, and then it's like, he just takes a pause and is, these people need help and it's not going to be just me and, and mm. starts to appoint others to continue to carry on his work. Um, and, and I think that's, just this fascinating turn because, I mean, we expect God to just take care of it all, right? I mean, if if God can't do it, who can, right? But yeah. but Jesus takes the time to um, equip and send these people um, to be his presence, to do that work. And I think it makes me remember that we are descended from that long line of disciples and we carry on Jesus command to go out and to continue his work, to um, free those who are oppressed, to feed those who are hungry, to proclaim this new kingdom of God that says the world doesn't have to be the way it is today. The way we're structuring society with the stratifications doesn't have to be the way it has to be. And and it's terrifying, and I both, I both think it's terrifying and love Jesus further explanation to the disciples, which is, we'll go out, but don't take what you think you'd need. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, when we go on a road trip, that van is packed oh my gosh. with everything we can need. We could probably live out of our van for a good month because um, we're prepared. Uh, but the disciples are told to go out with like nothing and, and to continue to do Jesus work and not rely on, on much at all. And I think for us today, as we think about what does it mean for us as Christians to live in our world? What does it mean for us, many of us who aren't going to a church building to get that, that weekly lift to know how to live our, our Christian lives? Um, to be reminded that Jesus sent the disciples um, just with what was on their backs and said that'll be enough. And I think You know, for me, I like a plan and I like control and I Mm. like to be prepared and I like to have all my contingency, you know, my extra roll of toilet paper in the car or whatever, um, all the snacks packed so I don't have to rely on anything else. And Jesus says, just go out there, do what you're supposed to do, rely on the people you meet, and it's not always going to work out. You're going to have to just knock the dust off your feet and keep going, um... And you might burn through a few towns without any work being done. And I think for us to think about Mm. the work we're doing to try to um, work towards anti-racism, to try to work towards inclusion of of all people, especially with Pride Month, remembering the Mm. LGBTQIA community and and the ways that we've um, pushed people who identify, you know, out to say, you know, you keep working, keep bringing people in, Keep changing yourself. Keep saying that we don't need some workers to be paid absolutely nothing that they can't survive on. Keep saying that. Keep working towards it. Um, and it's going to feel like complete failure a lot of times. Mm. But but keep working toward that vision that God has given us where, where everyone is fed, where everyone is healed, where everyone is welcomed. That's what we're working towards. And we're going to have some times where we feel like we just got slapped back, but, but Jesus is going on ahead of us and, and keeping pulling us forward.
moment to set aside an offering to our congregation or to those in need. As we set aside an offering, we are placing our trust in God that God will continue to provide for us, and so we give back what belongs to God. Let us pray. O oh God of justice and love, we give, we give thanks, thanks to you that, that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give, give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us join together to pray for the Church, our nation, and for all who are in need, responding to each petition with the words, Graciously hear our prayer. O God, the Holy One of Blessing, send your spirit of tender might throughout your Church and to all its leaders, especially Bishops Eaton and Aiken. Strengthen the believers who cannot assemble for worship. Guide the Church's use of technology and make yourself known to those who have no access to such materials. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Graciously hear our prayer. O God, the Holy One of Truth, as today we commemorate the fourth century theologians, Basil, Gregory, Gregory, and Macrina, we pray for your spirit on teachers, preachers, and missionaries. Empower the church as it uses both historic and innovative words to proclaim your gospel across the street and around the, the globe. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Graciously hear our prayer. O God, Holy One of creation, continue your care for the earth. Where there was fire or flooding, drought or storm, bring renewal of the land. Bless farmers and ranchers and protect migrant farm workers as they toil in the sun to harvest our food. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Graciously hear our prayer. O God, Holy One of Unity, as we commemorate this week the martyrdom of the Emmanuel Nine, who in 2015 were killed while assembled in their Charleston church for Bible study, we pray, end the scourge of racism and white supremacy, Protect protesters. Halt those who intend violence. Preserve our democracy. Raise up leaders who model repentance and reconciliation. And support legislators who seek justice in our land. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Graciously hear our prayer. O God, Holy One of Compassion, heal the sick and embrace the fearful. Visit the millions who are suffering from the coronavirus. Protect us from another wave of disease. Uphold health care workers and medical researchers as they work on our behalf. Assist the unemployed in finding a job. Show us how to provide safe housing and daily food for the homeless in our nation and around the world. We pray also for those we name here. Ali, Helene, Roger, Bev, Gary, Sean, Philip, Sonny, 
Matt, John, Anya, Carrie, Jamie, Anne, Clyde, Sue, Joanne, and Patty. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Graciously hear our prayer. O God, Holy One of Hope, sustain those who cannot endure their suffering but are led only to despair. Pour your grace into their hearts. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Graciously hear our prayer. O God, Holy One of Mercy, we pray finally also for ourselves. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Graciously hear our prayer. O God, Holy Eternal One, we praise you for the lives of all the faithful departed, both the famous and the forgotten. At the end of all things, bring to yourself all your treasured people to abide in your presence forever. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Graciously hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those desires too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gather into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Christ is with you. Thanks Thanks be to God. God.